Okay, so we are in some sense in the last lap of the course and we are looking at logic. So when you say logic, there are many aspects to what we are talking about. The first one is syntax or the language part. So, we first define a formal language which is the language of logic that we are talking about and we have rules to say what is a sentence in this language and what is not. Then we have the notion of semantics. which tells us that when we make sentences out of smaller sentences, how do they combine, what is the meaning of those sentences or in general we are concerned with meaning and truth. So what do the sentences mean is one aspect of semantics and is the sentence true or not true is the other aspect of semantics because we are really interested to use logic as a mechanism to compute in quotes true statements, to arrive at true statements through a syntactic process essentially. So, but to do that we first need to define whether a sentence is true or not essentially and that is done in the notion of semantics. Uh, associated with the notion of semantics, so given us, so one of the things we are interested in is that given a set of sentences S which we could call as premises or we could call as axioms, but something that we assume to be true without questioning that. We want to find out what other sentences can be true. So in, gen in particular, we may be interested in a particular sentence called alpha and we may be interested in asking whether alpha is true or not essentially. And to this end, we have this notion of entailment and we say that a set of sentence entails alpha if whenever those sentences are true, in those circumstances alpha must be true also. So in proportional logic which is what we have looked at so far, what do we mean by the circumstances? Basically we mean the valuation function which assigns a valuation to each atomic proposition and then we can lift the valuation up to the compound sentences and if we have a set of sentences which are true in some given valuation, then alpha must be true in that valuation essentially, there is a notion of entailment. So this is the semantics we define because we are interested in using logic for doing something, but we are also at the same time interested in doing it in a mechanical way. So the promise of logic is that you can sit down with a paper and pencil and decide whether a given sentence is true or not essentially. Of course, in the modern context. Uh, the promise is that you can write a computer program to tell you whether a given sentence is true or not because whatever you can do with paper and pencil, you can do with a computer program as well. So corresponding to the notion of entailment which is a notion concerned with truth values, we have a notion of proof uh, or derivability in the syntactic side of the language essentially. So we say that we can derive the sentence alpha given the set S. So we are given this set of sentences which we may call as a knowledge base or something like that and we want to find out now what else can we add to the knowledge base or database or set of sentences S and the notion of proof, so the notion of proof is based on the notion of rules of inference. And rules of inferences are basically rules which tell you that given some pattern already present in the set of sentences, what new sentence can you add to the set of sentences. So a rule basically will say if it has a set of antecedents, so for example modus ponens says that if you can see alpha and if you can see alpha implies beta, where alpha and beta could match to anything, any sentence then you can add the sentence beta to the knowledge base. So rules of inference are basically syntactic pattern based mechanisms for adding new sentences and the idea of course you have different 
kind of proof procedures. So, we have seen some of them uh, with something which we call natural reduction. which kind of flows with the rules of inference. Then there is something called indirect. We saw an example of this when we said that make an assumption P or alpha and then if somehow you can show Q, then we can show P implies Q. This form of proof is called an indirect proof where you start with an assumption and then arrive at a formula where the assumption becomes a left hand side of an implication statement. Then we saw the resolution method for proportional logic and there are other methods. So, for example, there is a tableau method which is very popular in many logic circles essentially. So, proof procedures are basically mechanisms for doing achieving this mechanically producing new formulas or mechanically testing whether a given formula can be produced from a given set of formulas and arriving at alpha this thing. So, as you can see there are two routes to arriving to alpha one is a semantic route which says that you look at the meaning of alpha look at the valuation functions or look at the semantics as to which propositions are true and then decide whether alpha is true or not that amounts to constructing a truth table and we said that truth tables are too large very often if the number of propositions is high. And instead we want to uh, use this mechanism of proof of generating new sentences till we have genera generated alpha essentially. Now, today we want to look at a different language. So, when we say logic is a language primarily it is a language uh, we can define different kinds of logic and we discussed this in the one of the early lectures that you know proportional logic is one of them, but there are more expressive languages uh, uh, which can express things in more detail. For example, there is uh, epistemic logics which talk about people knowing what other people know and that kind of stuff, but we are not going to that extent. We want to look at the next most the next level of language which is in fact such a popular level that almost everything that we do in computing falls within the scope of this language and this is known as first order logic and we want to look at that today. FOL essentially. In fact, everything that you do on a computer program, you know, on a computer, for example, you write a C program or a Java program can be seen as working in first order logic. The, the characteristic feature of first order logic is that there is a notion of a variable which is not there in the notion of a proportional logic, and we can talk about relations between the different elements essentially. So, let us define first the language first of the logic and I will do this sort of simultaneously I will work with the syntax and the semantics instead of first giving you the full syntax and then the semantics separately. So, we will do it in a slightly informal way I will keep writing the syntax and we will keep looking at what the system semantics corresponds to and we will see what kind of expression it allows us essentially. Okay. So, we are talking of FOL syntax now as as in proportional logic there is the logical part which includes symbols like this. So, we are defining the alphabet of the language here right. So, it, and so on which is very which is the same as what it was in proportional logic then symbols like brackets and so on. All this is borrowed from proportional logic essentially everything is the same. So, at this point I would again like to emphasize the fact that you must discriminate between the symbol that we are using and the meaning of the symbol essentially. So, I have used this symbol or I could have used the symbol and if you want to call this a symbol it does not matter what you use it is a symbol and the syntactic machinery basically looks at symbol as a something which can be matched with the same symbol. So, it is basically pattern matching whereas, the semantics of this symbol as we have all agreed is that 
it combines it determines the truth value of two sentences combined using this connective uh, by uh, in a specific manner. So, we know that alpha and beta is true whenever alpha is true and beta is true and only then essentially. So, that is the semantics side essentially. So, the semantics is just for our benefit to understand what the language is doing for us and valid and, and validate what the language is doing for it. The machinery itself does not use the semantics at all. The machinery just does pattern matching and so on and so forth. So, we had written the semantics of and as saying that alpha is true, alpha and beta is true, if alpha is true and beta is true. But when we talk about proofs, we have different things operating upon this symbol. So, we say for example, if p and q is given to us or alpha and beta is given to us, we had a rule called simplification which says you can add alpha itself. Or if alpha is given to you and beta is given to you, then you can write alpha and beta. So, we are not looking at the meaning there, we are only looking at the well defined procedure, which is what the proof procedure is we are talking about. So, these are the symbols which we borrow from proportional logic. Then we have uh, a set of variables. let us call this set V and typically we use symbols like x, y, z or sometimes x 1, x 2 and so on, it does not matter. Basically, it is a set of variables given to us, the variable symbols you might want to say. We do not, we sort of will, we will sort of not keep distinguishing between the syntax and the semantics. So, when we say a variable, we will say that it has its own well defined semantics. How is the semantics of f o l defined? The semantics is defined in terms of a domain. Domain D or some logic books that you might have seen, they also call it the universe of discourse essentially. Essentially, the domain is a set of objects or elements and the language of first order logic allows you to talk about relations between elements. Essentially. So, for example, you might have the set might be a set of people and you might say that for example, Ram is the brother of Lakshman. So, it is a relation between Ram and Lakshman and it is a brother relation. FOL allows you to talk about things like that essentially. Or if the domain is a set of natural numbers, you might say 7 is less than 11 essentially. So, it is a relation between 7 and 11 the less than relation and we are saying 7 comma 11 belongs to this relation. So, everything is in terms of a domain D and the semantics that we will associate with variables is an assignment function we will call this A which matches which maps every element of every variable to an element of the domain essentially. So, we are doing syntax and semantics at the same time. So, as we write the syntax, we will try to understand what is the meaning of those things. So, every variable would basically stand for a element in the domain essentially. So, for example, I might say there is a variable called x and the assignment will say x equal to 3 or x equal to 7 or x equal to 20. So, that is that is what the assignment function is doing. So, we would also write saying that x maps to x a. So, this notation we will use to say that this is x a belongs to domain and x belongs to the set of variables and this x maps to this. That is the assignment function which is doing for us. So, x a will stand for the for the for the image of x under this mapping. Then we have a set of quantifiers so to be very pedantic i should say a set of quantifier symbols but we will sort of use this term slightly lo loosely and the two most common quantifiers that we use are a symbol like this which we read as for all and a symbol like this which we read as there exists. 
So, it is traditional to when you see this symbol is traditional to read it as for all and it is traditional to read this symbol as there exists essentially. We will see the, uh, the semantics of this uh, as we go, but essentially these are quantifiers for variables here and they dictate what assignment are we talking about essentially. Okay. So, as you probably know when we use for all. So, if I say for all x p x where p is a predicate which we will define in a moment, then I am saying that take any assignment and this p x must be true essentially. So, we will come to the more formal definition later, but to at this moment let us just understand and say that the quantifiers are used to quantify what assignments can be used for talking about those variables essentially. And just when we are describing this, we can also make an observation that this is the characteristic of first order logic that you have variables and you have quantifiers over variables. If you talk about the so called second order logic, then we have relations or as we will call them predicates and we and we will have predicate variables and quantifiers over predicate variables essentially. So, that is a higher order logic which is not we are talking about in our logic predicate symbols will be fixed essentially. So, this is the logical part which is common in every language that we define and the non logical part in proportional logic the non logical part was a set of propos atomic propositions that we start off with essentially. In this case it is a set of uh, uh, there are three sets. So, we will define a language L to be defined by three sets which we will call P, F and C. So, these are three sets some books would use a symbol R instead of P. Uh, I have used P because P is stands for predicate here if you use R then it stands for relation essentially. Both are talking about the same thing the predicate comes from the language of, la of the logic and relation is basically defined over the domain. We do not explicitly talk about relations here, but predicates as we will see tend are intended to stand for relations essentially. Okay, so, what is this set? This is a set of predicate symbols. So, very often we use things like P, Q, R and so on, but we can also use things like brother, friend, all of these would stand for predicate symbols essentially. So, basically a set we define a set and the language that we are talking about will use those symbols essentially. Then, so this is P, uh, F is the set of function symbols. Typically, we use small f, small g, small h or f 1, f 2, but we could also use things like plus uh, father and so on. And as you can guess from this plus and father that function symbols basically denote functions in the domain essentially. Then there is a set of constant symbols. It could be C1, C2, or something. So it could be something like, for example, zero, which stands for a constant zero, or epsilon which could stand for an empty string any anything which is this thing. So, we are talking about the syntax of the language the any first order language is defined by these three sets a set of predicate symbols a set of function symbols and a set of constant symbols. What is the mapping of these sets? The mapping is defined 
by an interpretation function we will call this i and what this function does is that it maps every p belonging to p to let me just use for this moment a symbol p i uh, on the domain ok. So, we will just come to that in a moment essentially. Likewise, every function symbol is mapped to we will we'll come to this in a moment a function symbol f i and every constant symbol is mapped to a constant symbol c i, but in this case we can also specify at this stage that it is something which belongs to d essentially. So, the interpretation is an interpretation of the language. The language has as part of its con constituents these constant symbols and the what interpretation tells you is that what does the constant symbol stand for in my domain essentially. So, this symbol for example, might stand for the number 0 which is an element of my domain or this might stand for an empty string or a symbol like d might stand for delhi for example, which is we can treat, treat to be a constant and so on. So, there are two symbols which I have forgotten here which is this bottom and the top which is there in every language that we talk about here. So, this is a vocabulary of the language then we define what we call as a family of terms or sometimes we, we call them set of terms. Uh, so, the language we are working towards defining what is a sentence in our language. So, far we have only defined the alphabet for the language and now we are gradually working towards a set of sentences, but before we do that we need to define what we call as a set of terms and the set of terms let us call it T is defined as follows that if for every x which belongs to V for every variable that is we have x belongs to t. So, in other words we are saying every variable is a term then for every c belonging to c we say c belongs to t. So, every constant is a term. So, what are these terms that we are talking about the set of terms is essentially the set of objects in the domain essentially. It basically when we say x belongs to t we the semantics of that is that uh, x a belongs to d right? where x x belongs to v x a belongs to d that is what we are saying in the set of terms. So, x is a x is a term here we are saying x is a term here we are saying a constant. So, here we are saying variable is a term here we are saying a constant is a term and by term basically we mean something in my domain essentially. essentially. So, this c i also belongs to d and x a also belongs to d. So, one thing which I have not yet mentioned is that each of these predicate symbols or each of these function symbols has associated with it an arity essentially. So, they have an associated with an arity which basically tells you how many arguments it can take to, to take in the case of functions we will define them as terms in the case of uh, predicates we will define atomic formulas, but basically in both the cases they take a set of arguments and the arity tells you what that argument is. So, very often we write the arity uh, uh, below for example, we if we write arity 2 below plus it basically means it takes two arguments. If we take arity 3 below plus we say that it is a function of three arguments essentially. So, how many arguments it takes essentially. So, now we have variables as terms, constants as terms 
and then for every f n. So, when I write f n like this, it means this has arity n belonging to my set of function symbols and a set T 1 T n belonging to set of terms. So, this is a recursive definition as you will see, this is the structural recursion which we often use to define a language. The expression f n followed by t 1 t 2 belongs to term. So, we can take a function symbol of a given arity, then take that many arguments which must be terms, put them together and we get a new term essentially. So, for example, I could say something like plus 7 6, if plus is a function symbol of arity 2 then this expression stands for a term which takes two arguments. Now, you know that this plus for example, is mapped. So, for example, I might say something like this that uh, plus under the interpretation i maps to plus, okay, which I would have called plus raised to i. But let us be more explicit here, we are saying that plus mag maps to this plus which is an arithmetic operator in on the domain of natural numbers let us say. Then and if 7 and 6 are terms which map to respectively numbers 7 and 6, so which is of course, very obvious for all of us. Then this expression stands for the number 13 given the fact that I am interpreting the plus as a addition symbol, a symbol which stands for addition of two numbers and given that I am giving these two arguments with respectively stand for 7 and 6, then in my domain if I added 7 and 6 I would have got the number 13 and this term essentially stands for this number 13. So, we can define this here that given a term its mapping under interpretation and assignment gives us a term which is interpreted the function name which is interpreted followed by every term whose interpretation I have to do So, the semantics of terms is that either they are variables or they are constants or they are function symbols applied to an appropriate number of terms essentially and what they give us is a term essentially. So, this itself is a mapping from d raise to n to d. Basically, a, a function symbol defines a term and a function symbol also defines a mapping in the domain which is from d raise to n to d which I could have written here actually d raise to n to d, it is a mapping from d raise to n to d. So, it takes d arguments, n arguments and gives you one, one value or one result and all the arguments and all the all the values they come from the domain essentially. So, plus for example, is d cross d to d essentially. So, it takes two arguments and gives you one argument. We want to uh, look at formulas, eventually we want to move towards sentences 
But before we come to formulas, uh, so we want to define this set f of formulas. Uh, before that, we define the set A. of atomic formulas and these atomic formulas will in some sense correspond to the proportional symbols in proportional logic essentially. Okay. So, first these things they belong to atomic formulas. Then if P belongs to P, where P is a set of predicate symbols and P 1, P 2, P n belongs to the set of terms. So, P is a, has an identity n, then this P with identity n and T 1, T 2, P n belongs to a set of atomic formulas. Okay. So, an atomic formula in first order logic, which is also called predicate logic or predicate calculus, is made up of taking a proposition symbol of identity n and n arguments which must be terms essentially. Now, you must keep this in mind, this is strictly what keeps first order logic to defines the boundaries of first order logic, what can what is a sentence of first order logic and what is not a sentence of first order, first order logic. So, if I were to say for example, uh, the predicate name is believes and if I say John believes that the earth is flat then I can try and define a predicate which says two arguments as to who is the believer and what is the thing that is believed in. Then the believer is John and the thing that is believed is believed in is the flat earth essentially. Now, but flat earth is itself a relation. It is basically saying that the earth is flat essentially, something which is true or false essentially. So, this sentence that John believes that the earth is flat is not a sentence in first order logic, because you can only give terms as inputs and you cannot give formulas as input to that essentially. Okay. So, the predicate symbol that we are talking about is basically mapped to a subset. So, P i is a subset of d raise to n, right, if you where the, where the subset is a it is an energy relation on the domain D and the relation is this subset which has the tuples which belong to this set essentially. So, sometimes logicians talk about first order logic and they distinguish it from first order logic with equality. So, some people do not include equality inside the language, but some people do. So, let us just talk about the first order logic with equality here in which case we have one more atomic formula. So, we have this top and bottom as atomic formulas and we have taking a predicate symbol and put giving an appropriate number of arguments gives you an atomic formula. And now, if T i and T j belong to a set of terms, then T i equal to T j belongs to the set of atomic formula. So, in first order logic with equality, we have atomic formulas which talk about equality as well essentially. So, we have an expression essentially. So, which means when we talk about first order logic with equality, we must have the equality symbol also thrown in here essentially. So, this is a set of atomic formulas. So, before moving on to, to compound formulas or, or formulas in general, let us talk about the truth values of these atomic formulas. Because we want to talk about the semantics in terms of which formulas are true and which formulas are not true. We are we, so remember this truth values or valuation is a mapping 
to this set of true or false sentences. So, one thing we always do is that we always map this to false and we always map this to true and then we map uh, atomic formula of the first kind. So, I will not write n. So, it basically let us assume it is implicit T n to true if and only if the corresponding tuple which is T 1 I A T 2. So, when I write I A on the top it means by applying the interpretation and by applying the assignment if there are any variables inside. So, this is of course, something which we are familiar with we are just formalizing this notion that a predicate like this is true. So, if I say brother Ram Lakshman and I say brother Ram Lakshman maps to true if in the real world Ram and Lakshman the pair belongs to the set of pairs which define the, the set of brothers essentially hmm? or I can say that 7 less than 13 is true if in my domain I define the less than relation let us say I define it explicitly then 7 comma 13 belongs to the set of pairs which define the less than relationship. So, this we are familiar with the second kind T 1 T i equal to T j this maps to true if T i and T j stand for the same element. if they stand for the same element differently. So, if I say the prime minister of India and if I say Manmohan Singh, then I say these two terms are the same. In other words, Manmohan Singh is the prime minister of India, if in the domain they map to the same person essentially. Okay. So, that gives us a set of atomic formulas. Now, let us talk about a set of formulas. Okay, so, many people use the term formulas because some people use the term formulae, but I think the more modern style seems to be formulas here actually. So, here first of all we borrow everything we do in proportional logic which means we define things like alpha and beta, alpha implies beta and so on. So, this is like in PL exactly you borrow that. Okay. So, if alpha is a formula and beta is a formula then alpha and beta is a formula. Okay. So, we must of course, start off by saying that all atomic formulas are formulas and then you can use logical connectives to construct more formulas, but we also have formulas of this kind that for all followed by a variable name followed by a formula is a formula and there exists followed by a variable name followed by a formula they both belong to the set of formulas f that we are talking about. So, this is something new in first order logic it is that you can. So, recall that we just made an observation that atomic predicates they correspond to proportional symbols in proportional logic. In fact, you can think of a proposition in proportional logic as a predicate with 0 arguments essentially. So, there is nothing to follow after that it just becomes a proportional symbol you cannot break it down into further whereas, a predicate is breaking down in it into further. So, if I say Socrates is a man, we treated that as a proposition earlier, but now we would talk about it as man Socrates that we are breaking it down 
and saying that man is a relation of identity 1 which is defined over the set and basically Socrates belongs to this. So, man is a subset of the elements of the domain and Socrates is one of those elements essentially. So, the truth value of atomic formulas is defined here and the truth values of compound formulas is defined exactly like we do in proportional logic that we use the in fact, this is what gives the definition to what does this symbol and mean, what does the symbol imply mean and so on. And then we have this new formulas which say that for all x alpha and there exists x beta. So, when, when are these formulas true? So, we say, so let me write it here for all x alpha yeah under an interpretation and an assignment maps to true if for every assignment b that is an x variant of A Okay, so, let me first read this out. We are saying that a formula like for all x alpha under an interpretation and an assignment. So, what does the interpretation do? Interpretation defines all the predicate symbols and the function symbols as to what they stand for and assignment tells you what every variable is being mapped to in the this thing. We say that such a thing is true under a given interpretation and an assignment. If for every assignment b so, we are talking of other assignments now. What are assignments? Assignments give map variables to elements in the domain. That is an x variant of A. So, when we say an x variant of A, we mean that the assignment B differs from the assignment A only in the mapping of this variable x and all other variables it maps identically as in A. So, B maps everything like A does except for x which it maps differently. So, that is called an x variant of A. So, for every B that is an x variant of A. In other words, x can take any value. The formula now without the quantifier alpha, alpha i, but this under that assignment B maps to true. Likewise, there exists x alpha under i a maps to true. All this is the same except that instead of every we have some. So, for example, uh, if I have a sentence, so let us say that there is only one variable in our system so far, but and let us say we are talking about natural numbers. Then if I say uh, for all x, x greater than or equal to 0. I say that such a sentence is true under an assignment A if for any value that I plug in for x, this part x greater than 0, greater than or equal to 0 will be true essentially. You can do things like this uh, for all x, uh, x greater than y and then you can say that in this assignment a y is equal to something, but that is a little bit complicated we do not want to get into this and, and that is not the sort of thing we normally do. So, let us not try and do that even. But the crux of the matter is that a sentence quantified by for all x would be true if you plug in any value for x and the sentence becomes true and you remove the quantifier. Likewise, 
something like there exists an x such that e 1 x is a sentence which would be true if you can find some assignment which means some value of x which makes this second part true. So, I can say e 1 4 for example, so, because e 1 4 is true I can say there exists an x e 1 number is true essentially. What is a sentence? We still have not decide define what is a sentence. But to define a sentence, first we have to characterize variables into two kinds. A variable x can be either bound or free. So, a variable is said to be bound if it is quantified essentially. So, if I say for example, for all x p x y where p is some p is some predicate and x and y are variables, I can say that x is bound, but y is free essentially. So, if a variable has a quantifier then it is bound and if a variable does not have a quantifier then it is free. So, if I say something like this for all x p x y or there exists y q x y something like this. Then you can see that this is bound, this is free, this is bound and this is also bound. Why? This occurrence of y is bound because it, it comes within the scope of this quantifier which is defined by the brackets around here and this occurrence of y does not have a quantifier. So, this occurrence of y is free, but x is quantified by x and likewise that x is quantified by this x because they come within the larger brackets. So, a sentence is a formula with no free variables. This is the definition of a sentence. So, it must first be a formula well formed formula. So, all those definitions that we have of defining this formula set of formulas, set of atomic formulas and so on, it must be a well formed formula. So, notice that this is still this is also a well formed formula, but it is not a sentence because it is got a free variable inside. So, a sentence is a well formed formula which we are calling as formulas without any free variables and the intuition behind this is that because every variable is bound which means every variable's assignment is controlled by some quantifier, we can talk about the truth value of that variable essentially. Okay. So, this for example, we can map to true or false. So, all of you will agree that this is true, this is true, but if I said something like for all x uh, e 1 x, it is a sentence, it has got only one variable and it is something which is not true. So, I can say that this is not false, this is not true because the definition of the truth value according to this definition it says that for I plug in any value for x and then e 1 x must be true. Now, if I plug in 3 for example, then e 1 3 is not true. So, therefore, this sentence is not true. So, if I say something like this for all x, x greater than y. Now, this is not a sentence because it has got a free variable which is y and you can see that we intuitively cannot say whether this sentence is true or false because y could be anything essentially. But if I said something like this there exists a y such that for all x, x is greater than y then I can 
say whether the sentence is true or not true. Will that of course, depends on the domain and the interpretation function that we are talking about. Hmm. So, a sentence is something to which we can assign a truth value. Sentences are like this, which can be mapped to truth values. A valid sentence is true under all interpretations. You can choose any domain and any mapping for the predicate symbols and the function symbols and the sentence will be true. So, you can see trivially sentences like x equal to x or p of x implies p of x will always be true irrespective of what domains be true. So, satisfiable instead of all we say sum and unsatisfiable instead of some we say none. Okay, so, with this we have the basic machinery for working with first order logic. We have defined the language started off by alphabet, then the set of terms, then the set of atomic formulas and then the set of formulas and then finally, the set of sentences and we defined how to assign truth value to each of them and we can now talk about uh, this whether the sentence is valid or satisfiable or unsatisfiable. We will expand upon this part a little bit in the next class when we meet I think. Hmm. Okay, so, we will stop here.